What's happening? We're back. Uh, welcome to the 59th episode of the Slap Stream with Georgia. This is another special one. I know, I always say that, but it truly really is. I'm excited to be back. I, I feel this is kind of like the second season, and I'm determined to do this as, uh, as often as possible. Uh, and thanks to all of you that have been watching and subscribing uh, on uh, all these YouTube videos and leaving comments and all, all that uh, stuff that people do in YouTube world. Thanks for buying the t-shirts. If you'd like to get a slap stream, Art of Slap Base, Art of Upright Slap Base uh, t-shirts, please check out the, the description of this video and any other video as well. And thanks for all the Patreons that are supporting my work. There's no gigs. Gigs have been canceled uh, left and right. You've probably heard the last ones. For me, at least, I'm um, pretty bummed, but um, but hopefully we're going to be back to semi-normal or at least normal enough to play shows soon because I think that all of us are going to go nuts soon. Without further ado, I would like to introduce my today's guest, it's Joe Buck. Greetings. Welcome. Greetings from western kentucky all right uh what's happening from california <laughs> how are, are you california are you in la uh, i'm in los LA. angeles yeah 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 i've been in la for over 10 years now you can hear how quiet it is here <laughs> yeah it's uh tempting i do like uh california though but yeah. i love 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 your part of the world i mean that part of the U.S. All of the world, touring. beautiful. Oh yeah, absolutely. I agree. Uh, how are you? How have you been? What have you been doing during these crazy, challenging COVID pandemic end of the world uh, times? Uh, raising my son. Uh, we had a great time during it. <laughs> you know, you, you just take it as it comes. I guess I. Of course, I don't think any of us understand it, but uh, yeah, uh, it was great. We bonded like crazy uh, because I was teaching him and it was first grade. So it was like good that uh, we there was a respect formed because we had to do that, but we didn't fight or argue and it advanced our kind of relationship in a way, in a great way. And also, the school told me when he started, but we went one week before I pulled him out because they were going to school, but it was crazy what they were going through, you know, with all the shields and not playing with your friends and stuff. And he didn't like it. So I pulled him out and I did homeschooling, but they told me he was really behind and all this stuff. And I, I barely got hooked up to this thing. I don't like computers. I don't do computers. I still like recording to tape. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really appreciate you. You're doing this. But uh, so he. Uh, yeah, I didn't do any of the computer stuff and they were really mad at me and blah, blah, blah. But when it came to his test. He was by far highest in his class. And the teacher was like, Milo, blah, blah, blah. And I just was like, so it wasn't Milo that was failing. And they left me alone after that. And me and nice. him, we did our own thing. I didn't do any of that, any of that, because I just didn't want him on a computer all day long or anything like that. And he's doing great. And yeah, but that happened. And I still did kind of shows <laughs> uh, starting it was a while back I mean they all had to be outside <laughs> limited capacity and it, it was it was cool it was all right uh, and I just got off six weeks with weed eater and it was all um, everything like kind of we were even west of the Mississippi but it was all this side and uh it was all great. I mean, 
they they say there's all these mandates and things like that, but no, it's like it's not really happening. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And well, congr uh, congratulations on the success of your kid. Yeah, and, yeah. It's yeah. A, an amazing thing. It's like you know, balancing touring and a child is, uh, but it's all working good. So he goes with me a lot. And it's like he was he wanted to go on the full weed eater tour but uh, he likes he loves dixie the bass player but mm -hmm. but yeah and it's that so everything's amazing. what does he play he plays what? music that's what you said my son yeah well he he does a lot of stuff but it, no he's more into writing and uh, horror stuff oh okay so i uh, we yeah we have our 30 i don't do facebook stuff but uh, i'm my friends do it for me and things, but I have access to it. But when I do stuff, it's him usually. So we're doing our 31 days of Halloween, which is a different costume every day. Oh, cool. Oh, All yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, so music right. is good. Uh, just released a couple of my last two records on vinyl. Uh, I never had anything like that. I just basically like made them myself and hand drew CDs. I mean, I sold thousands and thousands of those, but first time I really had anything printed on my own stuff. Nice. Uh, we'll get into that. I would like to get into all the aspects of your career. So I would like to, uh, to start with the beginning. How did you become interested in music and how did you discover Operate Bass? My sister taught me, I, I've been playing music since I was two years old. I mean, the drums on you know, stuff with Shelton or like the Shack Shakers records or any of the records, it was like her 64 Ludwig kit. So she was a lot older, than, 16 years older than me. So she started me, I don't remember not playing music. And yeah, so I played out through school and didn't think anything of it. Really, it was like a parlor trick for me. I mean, I was playing barely as at like 13 or something like that, but yeah, it, it was just a trick. I was really good at it, but, and I played in bands. I was on tour when I was 13, <laughs> playing, a, I played drums, playing my 1974 Ludwig Vistalite, green Vistalite. Uh, I still have it. It's the only things I didn't lose to dope is because my drums, because I already started playing guitar. I left those at home when I left, and the only things I have are my two drum sets. So everything else was gone. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was in a thing called Happy Birthday America. It was like we went all over the country. Like I think we played all close to all fifties. I don't know, but a lot. And uh, Happy Birthday America, Happy Birthday America. So I did all that. Uh, thought I was going to be an athlete tore myself up couldn't so Eddie Van Halen well Van Halen in 1980 and I was like that looks like a pretty good job and so I got a guitar and learned how to play and after a little while it was like you know I was into all kinds of stuff it was like you know because I was way, way into punk rock music and uh, indie music but like in 85, I found Hank Williams. It was like, I was from a farm and I hated country music. And what I realized was I didn't hate country music at all. And that's where it started. It's like my friend, we were having one of our punk rock parties and my friend came over and he's like, he was from Dubuque, Iowa. He's like, God, I hate the music you guys play. And he had Hank Williams' 40 Greatest Hits. And that was it. I didn't listen to anything else but Hank Williams for like four years. It was like, made me an audio file because I was like, God, how could I have not known this existed? I thought I knew so much about music. And then it led me, you know, it's like, like the upright bass thing, it was like, because that led me to so many things, you know, it's like, it led me to Jimmy Rogers and, you know, I mean, the first records there was Jimmy Rogers and Carter Family and uh, Robert Johnson and the Fist Jubilee Singers even, you know, so 
I had to find out what else they'd buried and all the music I liked. Had a bright bass. And I love Louie Jordan. I mean, I love Charlie Christian. So, I mean, it was like, <clears throat> and it was good. Like in the early 90s, I was doing, still doing the punk thing, my band Baby and We were really good and doing well. We were in Chicago, but I'd already loved Hank Williams so much that it was like, I was just wanting to do that. And I really loved like bands in the early 80s, like Jason and Scorchers and R.E.M. And Jason and Scorchers especially, it was like, But I found Wayne Hancock and like Big Sandy in the 90s, I think early 90s. So were you already playing upright bass at that time? Absolutely not. I uh, know, okay. So it was like, because I was just like still like as a punk rocker. I mean, it was a hillbilly, but we were, you know, we're fucking out of hand, dope addict punk rockers, you know, so. <laughs> but just hillbillies, you know, so. But I just had it in the back of my head that that was what I was going to do. I wanted to be Hank Williams. Uh -huh. And it was all about like, no, man, I was like, already preaching it. It was like, you, we were, when we were talking about, when we were setting this up, you mentioned Pravda Records. And it's like, that, that was at, that label's out of Chicago. And I signed with them. And with, because Baby M, we were so junked out. And he sold my buddy Miles drum kit for dope and I was like yeah I had pieces of Buddy Miles drum kit man he had just sold it for dope and I just happened to have $400 that I was going to buy dope with but for once I chose a musical instrument over dope it was like because it was pieces of Buddy Miles's flag kit and you know it had Jimmy I had the Toms it had Jimi Hendrix exper experience on it and Mike Bloomfield and but yeah what he's hocked my drums for dope you still have it? no my Mike he's dead Baby M, her oh. player. I played drums in Baby M. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but me and Layla, it's, we, she was, took it, same rehearsal studio. She was in a band and I started writing these songs and made this song on a, four songs on a, a jam box and, gave it to Sue Miller. I wanted to looking for gigs and Sue had lounge acts in Chicago, which is, you know, the thing about Chicago, that was a legendary place, but she's married to Jeff Tweedy from Wilco. And, uh, but I gave her that like four song thing and she said, yeah, I love it. And booked a show and I, thought I was some opening act on a Saturday and I was like what time do I need to be there and she goes what's your show so whatever I went what are you doing it's our first show and she goes I took care of it it'll be fine she actually sold out lounge acts for us and it had started from there but it was on Pravda and it was like I thought I was kind of being like Hank Williams and but it turned out more like the cramps or <laughs> or you know gun club or something you know, and it was because I was playing electric guitar and she was playing electric bass. And we made a record and it did good. And we were out with bands like Southern Culture and, you know, Mojo Nixon. And we were doing good. I was, my drug addiction and alcoholism was bad. So it was like I was, it wasn't helping. But we were with Southern Culture and, uh, Indianapolis at the patio is like 94 and I just flipped out I didn't know about kind of the hipster like white trash thing <laughs> and uh, I saw these kids wearing PBR you know I mean drinking PBR and wearing John Deere hats and DeKalb hats and I thought they were making fun of me and mocking me and Rick was like, no, man, they love you, man, white trash. I was like, say that again, man, I'm going to punch you. Because I was trying everything not to be white trash. <laughs> and I was, but. 
it's so interesting for me like to hear all of that you know especially coming from serbia and from europe you know like i kind of uh loved all the all the music that you mentioned including hank williams and i kind of grew up in all of that which is the reason one of the reasons why i moved to the states it's because i wanted to play with people that grew up with that music in their absolutely in their blood, you know? thing <laughs> see absolutely and it was like after that show i flipped out it was like we we're never playing a song past 1951 and uh we're getting an upright bass and we're going to nashville and uh we're just gonna go and play country music that's cool so have you moved to nashville at that time no it was like like i said it was 94 and it's like no we left that night ah, and, okay. uh, it was awful it's like i love the drummer in the band but i told him it's like I'm, country music didn't have drums so i'm sorry oh it was, oh, it was uh, awful. Grand and, Ole Opry old style. Yes. I, I was like, it was like, I well, it was like the whole white trash thing, hipster white trash thing, dumbing everything down was like, they'd already done that with country music. And I was like, now rock music is, you know, just some mocking of me. You kind of get it? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, no, I'm not going to be a part of it. And it was like, even like Hazel Atkins and I, we were friends. And it's like, yeah, there was one time at Sleaze Fest, they were so mad at us. Sleaze Fest is just saying the Southern culture on the skids does in Raleigh, at the local 508, the bar there. And uh, I mean, Nashville Pussy was playing and blah, blah, blah. But me and Hazel were there and we were giving us press not to drink whiskey. We could drink beer, but no whiskey. And we were like, fuck off. <laughs> and uh, somebody walked right up to us. He goes, I love you guys. And gave us a half gallon of champagne. And there was this bush <laughs> that was like a, it was a tree bush kind of thing, but it like arced over and we were able to get in the center of it and nobody could see us. And just basically polished that thing off. And like, I barely got through my set and his set was screaming at the sound man for 10 minutes and that was his show <laughs> oh. but we, we were like why are we here man and it, and you were still on pravda at that time right yeah and they were mad oh. at me uh, oh. because the next record i turned in was a complete bluegrass well i'd gone to that i we 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 left that night and went to nashville and uh layla drove i was drunk and we got there and it was about nine. It was, it was 10, some 10, 15, 10, 20 in the morning and uh, like a homing beacon. We went right to Robert's Western World and Billy Burke and Daryl Burke were on stage. And uh, I didn't know their names at the time, obviously. But <laughs> and me and Layla walked in and live music at 10 30 in the morning, playing for tips and playing great old country music. And I was like, this is where we're going to find our home. And we did. So I camped out in Nashville for seven, eight years. And <laughs> the reason I play the upright bass is because Layla wouldn't practice. And I told her I needed her slap. And I, I think we really need to progress with this thing. And yes, you're good, but, but, but I mean, you're just resting. I mean, and I just, you know, and it made me mad. And because, yeah, we went back after we went to Nashville. It was like we went and the upright bass that I played on all the Hank records and all the Shack records, all those records. We only, I've only had one bass. It was the one we got for Gringo, the band on Pravda. And uh, we got it in Chicago and it's the bass in my room. But yeah, she wouldn't practice. And so I, and we were down on Broadway. We couldn't get a job, but uh, we got the upright bass, came back, and we played on the in the summer, and we played on the street, and it was like these are mid nineties, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, Lower Broadway. That's after yeah. your second Lower record with Prada, Lower Broadway, Second Avenue, and all that was yeah, abandoned, yeah. man, abandoned. Oh. It's oh yeah, like these and, days, huh? and Broadway was just Skid Row. Oh. Oh yeah, it's crazy, and uh, but beautiful, lawless, crazy, but oh yeah, like but when 
I tried to get a job inside and they wouldn't hire me. It was like Robert, which was my dude, became my dear friend, but like Robert, he, uh, he was like, y'all weird. And, and it was because I was a punk rocker, but I love the Stanley brothers. So I was playing a lot of bluegrass because I love the speed of it. And I, because my sister had raised me with classical music and all that crap, I couldn't get away from even in my punk bands and all the stuff. It, they had to be songs because I knew the difference between a song. It had to have a melody or it's not a song. So I was always driven by melodies anyway. And that's why I loved Hank Williams. I mean, the melodies are just amazing. I mean, and even the Stanley, I mean, Stanley Brothers, Bill Monroe, blah, blah, blah. But I love the speed of the bluegrass. And I was like, it was on a Baby M tour too. That was like, I fell in love with Stanley Brothers. It was like out of my mind, wasted. But I'm at a truck stop and there's like a, this rack, you know, when they'd have cassettes. It was in the, hey, I think it was in ni maybe 90, 91. But it was like these racks of cassette tapes. And it was like 30 bluegrass hits, $1.99. Okay. <laughs> first song was How Mountain Girls Can Love by Stanley Brothers and I was just like that's what I'm hearing in my head man that three part harmony and just blistering fast like death metal but yeah Layla wouldn't practice so I went around to all the bars it was like we just got the bar in Nashville me and Layla had a bar she still got it but yeah, we got the bar from Robert. That's the famous Layla's Bluegrass Inn, right? Yeah, my bar. Yeah. That stole from me. That oh. lied to Robert that said she had, you know, when, that I had abandoned the place and Toby, the owner of the building, went along with it. But, and it was like that I had abandoned the place. And it was like, that's odd, Toby, that you would go. I, well, I didn't know that they lied to Robert. I couldn't believe that Robert had signed off on it. But I found out later when Robert cried to me and told me how wrong it was what they'd done because he was in the hospital and they told him that I had abandoned the place. And I was like, uh, that's odd because Toby just saw me playing at the Greek theater with Shelton, with four, Hank three, with 4,000 people with my face on the jumbotron. Hadn't abandoned anything. But yeah, that hurt because my blood and my is all over that street. I mean, it was I mean, I I mean we, we didn't pay anything for the bar. They, Robert's just like, you want the bar? It's like, I guess. And we signed the lease. You know? <laughs> well, um, and, but yeah, so I just was playing around with everybody. And then I started getting gigs doing it. And then, like, when JD's band, the, his college band, the Shack Shakers, had broken up, it was like I was like, I was really playing good. And uh, Chris Scruggs and I were playing all the time with it was BR five four nine. We were doing this like, well, Hillbilly All Stars. They were Gary had left, and they couldn't play as BR five four nine. So it was Joe Buck and the Hillbilly All-Stars, but it was BR549 and me. But Chris had joined the band, mm -hmm. Chris Scruggs. And it was like, yeah. but Scruggs was also playing with me and JD. So it was me and JD and uh, Chris and Chris Detloff, the only one left from his college band. And when they had an incident with JD where they both left and it was just me and JD, that's why me and JD were, recorded that first Shack Shakers record by it was just me playing everything. But that's a cock a doodle don't? Yeah. That's already early two thousands. Two thousand two or two thousand three or something? Yeah, yeah, something like that. So were you touring with Shack Shakers? Well I mean yeah, we were it was me and Chris and Bob, but when they split, then it was just me and J D and we started recording that record. Oh, okay. It was it was nice. I had some redemption on that one. It's like Chuck from BR Five has been always so kind to me. It's like he's my friend and like you know my buddy. And it's like and it, you know he was happy when I got clean and all that. And I mean I got clean back in two thousand and one. So it was like that's why I even have a career. If I hadn't gotten clean, and nothing would have happened. I mean even Shelton. It was like Hank Three. It was like after I was clean about three months, he was like, "You ready to go?" <laughs> I was like, yeah.
because before that you couldn't take me anywhere. I just mess everything up. Could play good, but I would definitely mess things up. But yeah, I was like doing the we were touring together where it was like Shack Shakers and Hank Three. I was doing like I was on stage for like four hours and played ended up playing a long metal set, you know. But yeah. When have you started playing with uh, with Hank the Third? <clears throat> It was either 2001 something. So before the Shack Shakers? No, it was all during that. I just, we were, I was doing ah. all at the same simultaneously. I mean, like I said, I was like, there was one year I was like, I, I, I didn't even have any place. To, like, I was just coming, going in out of the bus into a van, out of the bus into a van. Because, yeah, we did. I mean, the Shack Shakers, when the record came out, we were on the road all the time, and so was Shelton. So it was like, but it was awesome. I mean, I had some of my happiest times. I didn't have anything except my instruments and a bag of clothes. And it, it was very, I mean, it was awesome, to be honest with you. But, yeah. I mean, I'm proud of all that work. I did it. was a great music. record. I'm I loved it because when when the Chris's left and JD was just by himself, it was like I didn't know what was up. And he said that, and they were they were recording him. It was Chuck and Cowboy Keith was engineering, and they had uh, Jimmy Lester from Les Dread Jackets and Dave Rose, Johnny Cash is a bass player. He's a brilliant bass player. Yeah, uh, I had him on the slap stream. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. it was all them and Kenny Vaughn and the whole thing. And they were recording JD with JD, you know, like back in JD. And they were recording JD wasn't really happy with it. And then we recorded. And I was like, me playing everything. And it was like, Cowboy Keith was just like, oh my God, that shit just crushed us what we did. And I was like, yeah, me playing everything against all the A players in Nashville. But, awesome. No, no, I had like some of the greatest. I mean, like Pete Anderson, like, I, you know, when you get calls, it's like Pete Anderson going, Where's Joe Buck? And when did he get out of here? I'm like, Who is this? It's like, This is Pete Anderson. I've got, Right. Who is this? Okay. No, it's Pete Anderson. Now yeah. I recorded with him, you know, and stuff. It was like, I was getting tossed around. Jason Ringenberg got my number and called me you know, from Jason and Scorches and told me I'd recorded the best record in 20 years. And I mean, he was one of my heroes. So, I mean, and Pete Anderson, too. I mean, it's like, I love Dwight Yoakam, man. I mean, I owe Dwight Yoakam a lot, too, because <clears throat> I, I just didn't view him as really a country artist because the only thing I was into that, like, was everyone kind of, it was him and Katie Lang and La Love It. You know, they all came out in about 81 or something like that. And it was like, they were just so outside that realm that I just didn't put them in with whatever the other garbage was, you know? Because, and I realized he was kind of fun. When he was touring with the Femmes, that's how I heard about it. But yeah, the first record, and so, well, it was the first three or four. It's like, those are fun, you know, crazy great records. But yeah, I'm proud of that work, all that work with Hank. I mean, those are, I mean, the the Hank 3 stuff was, we, not we, he, he uh, that was the last musical movement in the last 20 years. I mean, and the one before that was Nirvana. And I, I think we can, I think I can safely say that. You know that had an impact like that, and it's like I was very proud to be along for the ride on that. And it was like I felt like I was made for that job too. For how long were you playing with him? Eight years. Eight years. How many records have you done together? Well, I was on three. <laughs> Straight to Hell, the big one we recorded in my house. 
it's funny the first version of it was we were out with willie nelson and the first version of straight to hell was just me and him and mickey the harp player on a few songs from willie's harp player we recorded it in the bathrooms in between sets at those they were amphitheaters so it was like they had really nice bathrooms it sounded great but uh yeah, Straight to Hell and Damn Right and Rebel Proud. Those are both really... No, I was on Love, Sick, Broken, Drifting. I didn't play all. I was on one song in Love, Sick, Broken, Drifting. But when I joined them, the stuff with Curb was out of hand. The record label. So we wow. toured five years before we ever released Straight to Hell. Like hard. It was awesome. It was like I see early pictures of us and I'm like... God, we just, he didn't have any, I mean, he had his rising outlaw tattoo. That was it. You know, and I've got my scarf tie on, blah, blah, blah. And then, man, like five years down the road, you look like been at war and crazy, like something from Mad Max. We had been at war. Well, you were doing great music that influenced a lot of, lots of people. Oh yeah, there's lots of bass players that play bass because of Hank Three. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so after you left the band, what was what was after that? What was going on? <coughs> Hank Three was my most important work on bass. The most impressive work I did on bass was with Viva La Vox. After that. It's Tony Bones, he's from Philadelphia. Viva Le Vox. Huh. I did two records with him. But yeah, it's definitely my most impressive work. It's because of him, it's his songs. It's like, she's like gypsy jazz, like Django Reinhardt's meets Jess Drummer or something. But complicated beautiful voicings i mean he went to berkeley but only one year I and mean, you know what they say about berkeley if you graduate you failed <laughs> no it's the truth man it's like you're good at berkeley you're picked out and you know what i'm saying oh you're, yeah yeah sure he hires you and you're on the road but if you make it all four years, ah, sorry about that. Um, so besides those bands, like which, what are bands who have you played uh, operate bass with? Uh, Bob Wayne's first two records. Uh, Greg Gehring. I produced a record on Greg Gehring that's really great. Uh Dixie Rose. Uh, <laughs> there's a bunch more. As far as your slap base work, is there anything in particular that you can point me out to check out. Well, like I said, Viva La Vox. Okay. Just, can you look up Viva La Vox right now without shutting everything off? Uh, no. Viva La Vox. Look up if it's on Spotify, Dirt for Sale. Uh -huh. That's the name okay. of the record. I'll do that. Uh... Yeah, but okay, so that's... Uh... Yeah, got it. But yeah, I'm really like, uh, I, I, I just let my stuff do the talking. I don't, I'm not a self promoter. You can see that it's like, whatever. It's like my worst attribute when it comes to a musician is like, most of them are shameless self promoters. But you know, on those things, it's like, especially with the Viva La Vox stuff, it's like. I know there's not too many people in the world that could have done that. And it means a lot, but it's also, I mean, I spent, I was in a fortunate situation. I mean, or unfortunate, depending on what you say. It's like that in Nashville, we were playing eight and 12 hours a day and shit. 
It's like <laughs> to really have the strength to play upright bass. The thing's got to be in your hand all day. I mean, just relentless. I mean, I've had my blisters, I mean, or my calluses, like with Hank 3 sometimes. It's like I'd have calluses seven layers deep, you know. It's like where if you saw it in the sunlight, it looked like some kind of wax on the end of my fingers. Like clear, like deep. But, you know, you get one night where you just bad stage, crappy monitors. You can't hear and you end up overplaying. It's like there's one time I pulled off like seven layers of calluses off both my fingers. And it was just like, <laughs> and I could pull it over my fingernail like a rubber, I don't know, fingertip thing. I had to have my, I tied my hand up in the bunk. I was like, because it was so bad. Every time my heart beat, it felt like my fingers shot like 20 feet. But yeah, the strength. And it doesn't come from practicing. I mean, it does, but... I mean, you know, performance and practicing are two different things. Absolutely. So, I mean... <laughs> Nobody in music today has, I mean, they, even in national now, it's like because you get retarded down there now. They don't play any good music. It's all for bachelorette parties now, you know? I mean, maybe there's some places, but there's just no place that people can spend, have the time to learn their craft, to really learn their craft. I mean, because... Like those cats in New York that were so good. It's like, man, they were doing like five shows a day, man. New York is a, definitely a different scene. Well, yeah, not, Nashville is there's different nothing scene, going yeah. there now. But <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know. But I mean, back, you know, the 40s, it's like, it just I'm just saying it's like, you had to have live band if you wanted music. So that's why the music is stellar. It's like all of the modern conveniences we have in the world are making us morons. You can look at the first three records ever, well, four, but three records ever made. Robert Johnson, Carter Family, Jimmy Rogers. And it can be argued that blues never got better after Robert Johnson. And it can be argued that string music never got better after the Carter family. And an argument we made that country music never got better after Jimmy Rogers. You know, it's like, because once you could put that record on at your convenience, music was greatly diminished. Because before that it had to be go seen live and viewed and experienced and to never exist like that again and now at your convenience and then they have the radio and start playing records and things and so st people start hearing music over the radio and from recordings and, and there's something lost when you're not seeing it at the foot of the masters, you're just hearing it. And so when you're trying to replicate it, you're just not quite getting it. So every generation that grew up listening to recorded music, it was like a tape that you just keep recording over at one point if you just keep It'll be, you know, duplicating it. It'll be diminished to nothing. And that's about where music's at. Because you can't go from Mozart to Justin Bieber and call it progress. Not music. You know, so... Oh, yeah. 
I Man, that it, for sure. it, that's why I cared so much about music and why the country music thing and what we did. It, it was like people are getting, that shit was about something with Shelton. I mean, it was about his lineage. It was about so. It was about so much more than music in it. But I loved music and I saw where it was going and what was happening and I just couldn't be a part of like the like I said, the hipster indie scene it didn't wasn't much about music as more as about what you look like and <clears throat> hitting a target demographic. And I loved for the Hank, it was like it was everybody. Hippies, rockabilly kids, country people, metalheads, you know, folks, because we were playing folk music. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, it, that's why I was so determined. I thought I could do something to help turn it around. Maybe it did for a while. I do think there's a youth kind of revolution going on or something. But we'll see. I don't know if they have the... Yeah, I don't know when will be the next youth revolution in music. Well, I, it, it's... <clears throat> struggle... You know, I mean, most it's, it's about songs. And if you're writing words, I mean, you know, the, Hank Williams had a depth of wisdom through his life experiences. And people don't have that depth in life experience anymore. And it's like well, why? You can always talk about tablets and internet then. That's, well, that's what I was getting at with Facebook and things. Like, it, it, I mean, it was like, hurting my career so bad because I refused. I was like, I'm not doing this. I know what it is. I know that I was like, so it was just like, we were talking about music that blah, 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 these modern conveniences. Like now people can't even, they can hardly talk to each other. They've lost their verbal skills. If they can't use emojis and I, I don't know the, you know, but, I don't want to get on my high horse, but it's just life is rich in in so many aspects. But if if it's only it's like why recording sucks because none of it's live anymore. It's just recorded in bits and pieces of time and put together in a you know puzzle thing, and it's not live. You know, and life is a pursuit, and People don't have these, like, like with music, I, I think I liked it so much because you, you can't win. It's like, there's no winning. You can always be better. You can always write a better song. You can be a better performer. Put on a better live show. I mean, so they're, they're, it's always in front of you. And I always liked that because it was a pursuit. And I was okay with the fact that you can never win. But not not much of modern life is about pursuits really anymore. Not like that. It can definitely be a journey and then being better in music and discovering <laughs> new music. It's one of the best I, things that you can I, do. I, I am so grateful. It's like, I mean, I write my songs. It's like, I, a lot of my friends are just like, God, you're so pathetic. And I'm like, well, yeah, I saw it like, you know, songs like Planet Seethe and I saw the seething anger and I always kind of joke that what kind of made me good at music or whatever was, I was able to, because I played so much live and things, and so many hours on stage. And like now it's like, I know it's over 4,000 shows on the road. You know, and it's like, that's a lot. And it's like, to be able to play where you don't have to think about playing, where you can only have to evoke. That's that's a good feeling. And I, I'm blessed because I, I lived out my dreams. I really did. I felt like I was in the best band in the world and sometimes the best bands in the world. 
And I'm not saying we were, but I believed it. And I was lucky. I get that. That's the best feeling. You yeah. feel like you're on top of the world sometimes when you're on tour. Oh, I, I, I love touring, but it, but it's like anybody. I'll tell you, it's like it doesn't matter if there's fifteen hundred people or ten. If it's right, it's right. It doesn't matter. And it's just about the connection. My thing is with the connection with the people. It's the energy transfer or whatever. It's like it's a magic. It's magical to me. It's like that with wooden wire, you can evoke this energy that can collectively be welled up and become electric in a way. And it's real and it's weird and cool. I think that's why I like music so much. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good painter and a graphic artist, whatever. I just, but I was always drawn to music because you can't see it and taste it. I guess sometimes you can taste it or it smells so bad, but uh, and elusive and to do it right you have to expose yourself like you know the old saying like you know cracked and revealing you know with all your scars and everything it's like most people aren't willing to do that <laughs> trying to create a facade that people don't see that I'm like I'm waiting for something yep uh, I like this new band Rebel Matic I was on the road with but they're not new it's like they're older <laughs> mm -hmm. Funny, dirty old bastard's brother that plays drums. So, what is your what? What's the latest project with you? What was the last band that you were in, uh, involved with? Viva La Vox. Oh, okay. I mean, I just I've been doing my solo thing for almost twenty years. But you're still doing that, right? It's the only thing I do anymore. Oh, okay. No, nah, it's just. Uh, do you ever play upright bass like for your solo project? I do on records if I want to, but it's like the new record now and all the new stuff is all uh, backbeat blues, hillbilly blues. So it's not. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I could. It, it, it's like I love Willie Dixon, so it's like I could do that to it, but it, it's about my song. So it's like, it's like I'm so grateful. It's like I, I, I don't play electric anymore. I play acoustic, and it started because noise things in Europe that like. I mean, I was playing a deluxe reverb in my 1948 Gibson ES125 and a kick drum, and almost getting arrested I was just like so I started playing acoustic and I started playing over in Europe acoustic and I liked it a lot because I could hear real well singing and yeah it's working out really well I mean I was just a weed eater I mean I don't know if, you know heaviest doom metal band going and there I am with my songs playing acoustic and it's just working out great and killing them. And most of the records have like real heavy guitar riffs and they're good riffs and all whatever, but it's like, I hardly play the guitar anymore. I just sing. I play guitar, but I'm almost 60. I'm 59, so... I'm in my old man stage where it's like, at least I'm not doing the David Allen Co. thing and the Hazel Atkins thing and the blah, 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 where I stop every song after about like a two ver like two lines and then start telling some story about rock and roll history. I was like, when I get that scene out, I went to somebody to pull the plug on me. I love David Ford. I loved Hazel Ford. I was just like, Hazel, if you just play your songs. No, these kids need to know. <laughs> like, I know they need to know. 
Well, you no, do it, have interesting it would be stories, a history so. lesson. It would be a history lesson. It shows about music because it was mm-hmm. so important to him. He wanted it. I mean, Hazel played by himself because, I mean, because when Hank Williams came on the radio, they didn't say Hank Williams and the Drifting Cowboys. They said Hank Williams. And he thought he was playing everything. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> so he started his one man band. Oh. But yeah, so Hazel would just tell like history lessons. It was beautiful. They were astute. I mean, Hazel was a smart guy. Do you have any tours scheduled or any shows scheduled in the near future? I am in Charleston, West Virginia tomorrow, and I'm in Johnson City on Tennessee on Saturday. Oh, cool. <coughs> Is Joe Buck yourself? Yeah, but I'm in Detroit on uh, Saturday, the weekend after that, and then Chicago on Sunday. And then the weekend after that, Thursday, I'm in Kansas City, and then I'm in. Milwaukee or Springfield. And then the next week I'm down in Atlanta and Florida and somewhere else, Charleston. What is the best way for people to find out where your gigs are? It should be easy. Joe Buck yourself. But I know it's like, I don't know, Facebook, Instagram. I don't do that stuff, but the dates are up and stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I'm playing all the time. It's like I, like I said, I take care of my kid. I was lucky I could do the six weeks, but uh, I won't do another long tour until until it won't be spring. It'll be kind of like early, late winter. But uh, I'll do a long one then. And I'm not doing Europe this next year because. And uh, stuff still not really going over there. No, I was just there two weeks ago. Where were you? At? Were you in Serbia? I was in Serbia. Yeah, I was in Serbia and Croatia. Those are both two that I love, and it's, I mean, I'd love to go to. And it's because I played Slovakia, I played Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland. Mm-hmm. Like it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people that play Hungary usually stop by Serbia and Croatia. I know. Yeah. I, I could live in Budapest. I could. Yeah. I, mean, I love Budapest. I love I love the eastern countries. I don't want to get anybody, but it's like even in Germany I like I really like East German people. And I love further east I get, even though our language barriers are tougher. I really like those countries a lot. I'm lucky I've been over there so much. It's like, I really, I mean, it's crazy. I do it by my, it's not crazy, but I do it all by myself. See, it's easy when you do stuff by yourself. So when you tour, you tour completely by yourself? Yeah. That's oh, wow. With me. No, I'll do like eight weeks in Europe and, uh, yeah, all by myself. But do you have like any, any like road crew or? No? Nope. No? Okay. Arch, I drive. Do the show. Sleep in the van. Right. No, no, Tori is just like, because I, I just got to the point where it's like, I just don't bathe when I'm on the road anymore. And it's like, yeah, like eight weeks over there. <laughs> the funny thing is, is you don't, my clothes smell awful because I've worn the same pair of pants and I wash them. I really can't wash the pants anymore because I had to put leather patches in them, but <laughs> the clothes smell terrible because I've worn the same thing for the last thousand shows or so. The same t-shirt and the same pair of jeans. But after a couple of days, you don't smell bad. I mean, not really. It's weird. It's like my friend John, I had the hoot and over there one time with me and he and uh, he's really a smart kid. And he's just like, that's it. See, he explains it. See, we were we, we didn't bathe, you know, 100 years ago, or whatever, you know, like this. 
you know, like every day taking showers every day and things. And it's like, we're washing off this necessary bacteria. It's like, he was even like, when's the last time you've seen Joe Buck sick? Never. He's like, he's a, because I'm living in filth. I have so much bacteria. I mean, nothing can hurt me. But yeah, he was like, because they were in the van with me. I told them, I go, if it gets that bad, I'll, and they go, you know, the weird thing is, I think we smell worse than you. And it's like, but I'm sweating like a pig every night. They just, was it true? Were they smelling bad? No. They no, even the, I wear a bunch of, I wear stuff shit on my wrist, and it's like, <clears throat> they still smelled like detergent. I'm not kidding. <laughs> but my clothes smelled awful. I mean, it's like, it was like Jello Biafra's like tour manager. So this guy's like, been a, he's an old school punk rocker. It's like, I get my van now. It's like my, we just have my friends. I use my friend's van, but he's in, he's Dutch. He's in the Netherlands, but I used to rent from right over the border. And, uh, it was like Jello Biafra's like tour manager and blah, 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 old school punk rocker. And when I returned one of the vans one time, he was like, I've smelled that in 40 years because I'd put my clothes in the back and then let them dry. But yeah, it's punk rock. It's just too much trouble when you're doing it all by yourself to go to a hotel. I don't like leaving my stuff. You know? Moving stuff around. When you just go from gig to gig, I just drive to a truck stop, well, a rest area, whatever it is, and sleep and go to the next gig. And I hate days off, so I usually don't have days off. Do you have a chance to see and, and hang out in those cities in Europe when you go to when you, when Absolutely. You tour? I, it's that's the only thing that sucks. Is that, no, it's like when I'm driving into Paris or what if, especially like large cities and stuff like this, it's like all I'm doing is trying not to hit somebody. Uh. <laughs> and it's like, but it, it always works out. I, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm a world traveler. It's like I drive in those places. It's like I, I tell everybody. It's like, the, I mean, like there was one tour I didn't even have a phone. I had GPS, but I didn't have a phone. I had a TomTom, -tom. but it was actually beautiful. <laughs> if I was so worried about me, and I was like, you realize people used to circumnavigate the globe with a sextant by the stars. It's not that hard, people. As long as you make it on time to the gig, right? Yeah, I, I liked it one time. It's like when I have, I, a lot of the bands that I, that I tour with and stuff is like, just because I'm so old, they're much younger and stuff. And sometimes when I go to Europe, I take bands. I've taken Viva La Vox. I've taken Hooten Hollers. I've taken Rachel Brooke. <clears throat> just to introduce them to the European crowds. I knew they'd love them. And uh, we stay in hotels and stuff when it's like that. But I'm by myself, nope. <laughs> and it's also financially, it's like, I mean, I've made a living playing music. I mean, a real living for 30 some odd years now. It makes it easier when you don't have to pay anybody else but yourself. I mean, if I, I, I probably couldn't even do the numbers to have a four-piece band, and make, I couldn't make a living, you know, or two-piece, if they had to live out of it as well. But by myself, it's an amazing living, actually. Because it can exist anywhere. It well, exists. Yeah, it exists. It work, I, it, I work really well on a really giant stage. I work really well in the corner of some punk rock bar. Because it can exist anywhere. What's your favorite? Huge stage or a corner of the punk rock bar? <clears throat> no, uh... No, don't get me wrong. I like playing. I like the challenge of playing a big stage by myself. Mm -hmm. But no, I, I like being on the floor, 
and them looking down on me. It, it's a problematic because with a lot of people, they can't see me. But I like being on the floor and I like them looking down on me because I sit down and play. I play drums and play guitar. And it, I think that's a cool way to look at a show because usually they're looking up at you. They're looking down on me. So maybe you should play in one of those old empty theaters. I am working on something that's like, you ever heard of those poor bastards? Well, the, it's Lonesome Wyatt and uh, Rachel Brooke. All three of us can do great jobs, completely acoustic. And there's just not a lot of theater happening these days. And you have all these beautiful, like, 125 seat capacity theaters, you know, small theaters around the country. Beautiful, with beautiful acoustics just sitting there. It's like, once again, my punk rock thing is like, go where there's nothing. It's like Live Nation owns everything and blah, blah, blah. They don't own that. And it would be nice. I was like, if the show went like I thought it would be, we'd do like tour it in these theaters and then hopefully we could get a residency in New York and in LA and in Chicago where we could do a month in each of the cities because it would be that quality. And it is that quality, but people don't even hear acoustic music anymore, you know? Hardly. Unfortunately, but all the artists that you mentioned, starting with Robert Johnson, you know, and everybody else, it's here's I'm something gonna, for your bass player. Best music. Those records, none of it was ever plugged into an amplifier. I would never plug an amp upright bass into an amplifier ever if I didn't have to. Hmm. No, some of the best times was down at the club. It was like, I used to use a SM57. Mm -hmm. I used a Latin percussion conga mic clip that I could clip on the rim of the bass. And I could shoot that 57 right in that hole. It sounded great. That's your favorite way to record your upright bass? Oh, mic. I never used an amp. Okay. The only recordings that may ever come out, we recorded with Danzig and uh, that. We, I, it was a really low volume, but and but they recorded it, and I was using an amplifier. I was using my SVTs. I played it <laughs> with Hank Three. I played well, depending on what tour it was, or whatever. Sometimes it was like I don't know if I ever used maybe three sometimes, but. Pro V fours and fifteens. It's like on an upright. It's like I don't know why people use tens, man. It's like fifteens are where it's at. That's an interesting approach. So fifteen is your favorite? Oh, by uh, by far. Or upright? Absolutely. So what did you use? Like a several fifteens or? It depends. It was just like. One head, one cab. So if I was using two cabs, it was two heads, you know, two, uh -huh. three heads, three cabs. <laughs> but I was running as my Englehart. I play an Englehart that Jason Brown, uh, one of Hank's first bass players, like shaved the neck down on me because I had also had this like K from uh, <laughs> Nashville Public Schools. <laughs> And uh, the man it had this beautiful little neck on it, but the bass was just destroyed. It'd been rotten and like, you know, plywood, but, but it was like, I could still play it. It was rutted up pretty bad, but I really loved it. It was just the neck size. So I had the neck shaved down on it and I used an Underwood pickup with just one pole in the treble on the bridge. I'm gonna do the G string. Fishman, cheap Fishman amp, preamp.
That was my life setup. It worked good. When you send a preset EQ signal to the house for the direct line, and we were micing the cabs too, but we need a good pre QD signal, it makes a big difference. I mean, we got our base when there's like a guy that we worked with a lot, Randy, who's a Melvin's old sound guy. Then when we were working with Randy, it was like we joke we could have my bass checked down to one note. Because he's pretty much set everything flat and then just crank it. But yeah, the amplified thing is a very elusive because I've had every. I've used every set of strings made. I've used every amplifier. I mean, every pickup ever made. I mean, it's an elusive sound. So Underfoot, Underwood would be your pickup of choice, if I understand correctly. It just, yeah, it just seems the most natural mm -hmm. tonality that's even and is rich. So you were never use, using anything for the slap in particular? No, man, I, that that's that that's not how that that's not how an upright bass sounds. Like when you have the pickups in the neck, you're not playing the bass hard enough. Because, I mean, I have pictures that people have taken that like where it looks like a bowing arrow. You know what I'm saying? That the string that when I've got the string, it looks it is so far off the bass you couldn't believe that it would stretch that far. And the sound is, you're hitting it, but the sound is, kabam! And if it doesn't do that, and you're just going, you got no tone, man, because an upright bass is pushing air, and that is not pushing air. And it is, no, man, you can stick your hand underneath my action in my bass, your arm. And I use Getz strings, you know those? Mm -hmm. All Get, even E string. Uh, on tour, I'd have to thank God for David Gage in New York, man. I I I, I collapsed my base, the bridge at uh, at CBGB's, and the end the sound post had fallen. Thank God it happened right at the end of the Hellbilly set, right before a metal thing. So didn't ruin the show or nothing, but I had to have it fixed. And I took it to David Gage, and it was like they, some young kid, like an apprentice, was there, and he was going to do it. And they were laughing at the bass because I had duct tape on it where I just ripped it apart on the bottom. And at that time, I had a weed whacker line on it for a G string because I was going through G strings like every two or three days. And uh, so I just went to a weed whacker line. <laughs> and uh, and I was using Getz, but I couldn't afford, like, because I was paying $400 a set. And I couldn't afford to get G-strings at 400 So this kid's, like, looking at me, they're all kind of laughing about bass. It was all butted up. And the oldest guy in the shop came and knocked that kid out of the way. And just rubbed the bass like he you know, rubbed his hands all over it. Shit, and he's like, "This is a beautiful bass. This bass has been played." And man, he planed it. The fretboard. And he like even looked over and he goes, "Best jazz player in town uses a weed whacker line. Don't listen to him." And fixed my bass up, just beautiful. And then they sold me like G strings for thirty five dollars which where I could buy singles, that was a huge deal. Because <laughs> my E's and A's would last, you know, two months, three months. And I liked them when they got ochred up and really rough because they were easy to grab. Because when they got, but, but the G strings and the D was about every five days. They'd get flat, like they'd just get, Thin, flat, like in the positioning, like you know, with E and A, and blah, blah, your positionings. It was just they just get flat. But yeah, David Gage, thank God to him, like 
that string thing and it wasn't an endorsement or anything it's like you know you can only get those from germany and that was that helped out a lot but yeah your strings are everything and it's like those are the only ones i found that were thick enough that you could really pound on it but I, no when i play I don't need any help getting that. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, people think there's drums on the record sometimes. I mean, there's no drums on that track. Just the upright. Oh, yeah, stop it. But, it, and I know that, like, you know, uh, and I know Jason uh, Burns at King, and I know a lot of that was initiated by, by him, and, and, and I know there's people that can use it that, I don't think Jimbo ever did from the Rev. <laughs> I played Slim Jim Phantom's bass. I was doing the me and Sean Wheeler. That's the one that I forgot. Sean Wheeler, you ever heard a throw rug? Sure. Sean, one of my best friends in the world ever. He and I made one of the best records ever, Buck and Wheeler. And uh, yeah. but I was out in California on tour, and we did it when I was on tour, and I didn't have my upright with me, and it was like. But the first bass they bought me to, bought me to play was Lee Rocker's, the real one, the Stray Cat bass. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, I couldn't play it. And I think it had Parazzo's on it. Like some, they were good. So, they, they, so they, that's they were a, flat wounds. They were steel. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He uses he was, a P bass pickup. He was using Yagers at that time. Well, it's like well, he, 2000s, he, right? But it had a P bass pickup in it, basically. So they had to be metal. Uh, yeah, yeah. They were, they were steel strings, yeah. But they were, and I was just like, this is really cool, but I, I, I don't know what to do with this. And then some kid brought me a beautiful, like, okay, that was beautiful. It had gets on it. <laughs> I was like kind of laughing about it because I chew, chew them up so fast. But the strings were like, wow, they were so slick and nice. I was like, wow, this is what they, because mine would be like, look like barbed wire. Because they would just start, fry, you know, fraying. Man. And that's that's around the time where Buck and Wheeler record? Well, no, that, that was when, that was a Buck and Wheeler record, yeah. Okay. It's a great, that one's going to be released on vinyl pretty quick. Oh, it's a, cool. I'm so proud of the record. It's like me and Sean are like magic together. It's like we even played it where I was at a festival a couple of weeks ago in Muddy Roots and he, he was emceeing the festival and he goes to me, he goes, Hey, I had this idea. I want to do this thing. And, and he was like, he's saying about like a, not even a full verse or anything that he's like, I go, Sean, you know how we work. I don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> so yeah, it's like, we don't have to, practice or whatever i don't want to know where we're going i know where we're going wherever it takes us and it always works i mean the first five songs we recorded we had absolutely nothing and did it in two days great songs great arrangements everything like it's just okay next to, you know just making it up right there and it was like the few i mean, like i said that's sean and i have an amazing connection where it just happens. It's really beautiful. I've been fortunate enough saying I'm in room with some really great singers. Great, you know. I mean, my early bands, Baby M, my punk band, Baby M. I mean, Mike's daddy, of course, he'll deed and die, but that was a seminal experience for me. It's like we're rival bands, and it was like the Hank Williams thing. It was like. <laughs> We were at a party and we're kind of, what's up? It's like, what's up with you? And I was like, I don't know, just fucking listen to Hank Williams. And we're best friends after that because his old man was a Vietnam vet and he was a cool dude. He was like, and his mom was Korean. He was like six, eight, looked like some freaking Mongolian with like, you know, ass linked hair. And, uh, but yeah. He's like, my old man listened to Hank Williams all the time. And he thought it was so cool that, you know, punk rocker was this Hank Williams. 
Yeah, is that the original punk rock? Yeah, it is. I mean, people always like when I, if I ever say like Jimmy Rogers, it didn't get better after Jimmy Rogers because I've told this story before about music. And they go, what about Hank Williams? I'm like, Hank Williams was fucking rock and roll. It was blues music and string music and hillbilly music and Western swing and all that and jazz and all that coming together in that skinny little man, you know, to exist in that brief moment of five years of his recording span and never to exist again like that. I mean, it all came together in him and then broke away, like shot off again. But yeah. I mean, we Hank talked was- about uh, your uh, your base, bases and uh, bases that you own. You said that you only owned that one angle heart. Yes, my only bass. Do you still have it? Yes, yeah, in my bedroom right now. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it still have the uh, all guts? Yeah. All right. Still so have the next time you're gonna play. As the Hank three, uh, the three bars on it. Ah. Got one. <laughs> yeah. It had one signature on it. Everybody was like signing stuff. I didn't. Uh, the only person who ever signed my bass was Tony Alva. <laughs> I was at a show and it's like, uh, Tony Alva was at a show and just freaking out on me, man, because he's a bass player. And I was just like, yeah, man. And it's like, and it's the whole time I'm going, God damn, dude, I had your fucking poster on my wall when I was like fucking 13 years old. Oh my God, you're Tony Alva. <laughs> Were you a skateboarder? Yeah. Yeah. In a, in that hillbilly town. We had one mm. sidewalk that you could basically skate. <clears throat> it, it, we made them at first. We were making them out of uh, just uh, plywood and uh, old metal skates. You know, where you could take them apart. Mm-hmm. They had metal wheels. And we were making them like that. And then I went to my family went to St. Louis and I got a skateboard magazine where you could order stuff. And yeah, I saved up my money and got a Hobie, a 30 inch surf rider with the G and H, the GHS trucks and uh, no Bennett trucks and GHS wheels. I thought it was so hot shit, but we didn't have like the, the, we were most like just downhill and slalom kind of guys. It was like, we didn't, we saw the tricks, but because there wasn't a lot of videos or anything or on television, you, you just didn't grasp what was going on, you know? Hmm. But no, I loved it. It was like, that was maybe the punk rock thing. It was like, wanted me to get off the farm or something. It was like, cause when I saw the skateboard magazine, what those kids were doing out there, it was like, you know, Dogtown, man. I had Dogtown written on my damn high school, you know, notebooks and shit. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> Just knew that's where those guys were doing that. And it looked like some from a different planet. Because <laughs> I had wheat fields and corn fields and cotton fields around me. Tobacco fields. Which is awesome. But those pictures when like, you know, when those guys first started doing that, it was like, wow. But yeah, so I let him sign my bass. <laughs> it's rubbed off now. Oh. He never played upright bass, right? He's He's been always no. an electric guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So was that at a, a, a Hang the Third show? Yeah. Oh, cool. How did he like it? Oh, he loved it. Awesome. No, it was like... A, I mean, dude, Danzig. I mean, through Hank 3, it's like, I mean, I've most rock stars will just disappoint you. Like, wow. All the success and just a miserable fuck. But I've been the fortune of meeting some amazing ones, like Randy Blythe from Lamb of God. I mean, he's just an amazing dude. Uh, Danzig is a very nice man. I mean, I, it was funny. It's like, 
because I'd already, I'm an old man, so I'd already found Hank Williams. Hank Williams 10 years younger than me. So the Danzig and Misfits thing, that was his total thing. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, so when we were recording, we were going to do a show with him on 666. It was at the Henry, it was at the Henry Fonda Theater in L.A. And so he was playing with us. So we were rehearsing. But they recorded it. But he's, uh, he was nice as he could be. Like a gentleman. I know that sounds crazy, but soft-spoken. And you talk about a pro. Total freaking pro. He like, <clears throat> he really kind of latched on to me like, because I, the weird thing is, I don't think he'd ever played with a real upright player, and I was just like, it's so weird. Like, I was like, you're metal Elvis, dude. You know, come on. I don't mean that disrespectful. I just thought that he would have had his chance out in L.A. to play with any of the shit out rockabilly dudes, all he wanted, you know. And, but I don't know. But he was really drawn, and he comes over and he goes, he wanted to do Angel of Sin, Angel of Death. I mean, it's a Hank Williams song, and he just was like. Looking for this like low, dirty drudge thing, and I just started going. Doof, 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 doof. And man, he just kicked in. When the angel of death come down after you, can you smile and say that you're red to me? The angel of death. Sorry, did my best dancing, but uh, he was like making up the melody and everything, and it was just brilliant. Like the best interpretation of a Hank Williams song I'd probably ever heard. It's like, way to go dancing. No wonder you're dancing. You're dancing. But total pro. Like, and I'm, I know that stuff's going to be released. I heard it. It's like, because I knew that he loved it. But it was just me and him and Hank 3 and uh, Andy Gibson playing steel. No drums. But yeah, it's most interesting. Did you imagine most uh, the, stars and celebrities disappoint me like crazy? Oh, uh, yeah, I bet. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Angel of Death because my band, Tiger Army, we that's the opening song for us, uh, the undubbed version. Yeah, it's a great song. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent <laughs> song. It sets the vibe pretty cool. Yes, it's uh, I, I. I mean, uh, maybe it was like his macabre side with Hank Williams. I mean, but it's like he was a special writer and whatever. It's like I, it's what my words writing and things like that are so important to me. It's like that because I mean, I labor over this shit. It's like because it, I know what good is, I know what great is. And when you do, you can't fool yourself, you know? So. <laughs> But I'm just grateful that it's like, it's, like I said, it was like, we're just like, even we did, we're just like, nah, it's crazy. We're still 59 and I'm playing for kids still. I like it. And then give the old man a chance, you know. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned quite a few times how lyrics are important for you. Do you have <laughs> any special uh way of writing is there any particular uh pattern or it could be anything uh i don't write love songs it was like you either got two choices you write love songs or it's political really i don't mean like political like you fuck the government blah 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 but it's either some societal thing or something and it's like that's where i choose to go because it's like i don't and i write i mean i, I my stuff is really i mean it's really it's religious music but it, it's rock and roll because you either got two choices you like from where i'm from you play in the church or you play rock and roll, it's like either you praise God or you scream at the devil for fucking out with you, you know? Not praising the devil or whatever, but acknowledging the effect that you've let the devil into your life and it has affected it negatively, you know? So 
So I write about the devil and God and demons a lot. And things that fuck with people. And it's just a way that it's like I'm talking about alcoholism or, I mean, Evil Motherfucker from Tennessee. It's one of my songs that everybody knows. It's like, it's about being a drug addict. You know, but of course, because I'm an evil motherfucker. You know, that. I want them to go out of their minds, like rocking out, but at the same time, I want them to leave with like, they got whatever angst they had, like out, to help them not carry it around, maybe. Because I definitely know what that is. And so the words are important to create that ability to exercise those demons it works like with acdc it's like that's what i always said it's like with kids we'd like rock out to acdc and or van halen and we wouldn't have to do stupid shit because we got it out you know same with just playing loud and whatever i think those kids are having so much trouble they don't have any outlet like that that really they can get the aggression out just need to get him a guitar, turn it up, <laughs> get him an upright bass, just try to break that thing. Well, I love that you just slap it, it definitely looks like it. Well, there's the, the upright bass is an important instrument because it can move music like no other instrument can, like that. The electric bass can definitely not do that. Oh, so, I agree. So it is a very unique instrument because it can move the music like no other instrument, like a guitar, not like a steel guitar or fiddle or whatever. That upright bass played right and whatever. It can move a band, like move a music song like nothing else. I mean, like so many upright. Like Willie Dixon's one of my favorites. Obviously, he played on all that Chuck Berry stuff, but I mean, his band, Big Three Trio, it's like... Oh, yeah. Big Three Trio is the best. Yeah. Ain't gonna be you. We'll give in. Come on, come on, come on. I was talking about that with Rebel Matic. It's like, we're gonna do shows or a black punk band out of New York. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, it's like the drummer's, like, the drummer's brother is Dirty Old Bastard, like I said. But yeah, we were talking about that. I was like, because I was like, yeah, man. It's like, Big Three Trio is like, Talk about fucking punk rock. You know, I mean, Jesus Christ, I love it. I love Scatman Crothers. It's like, you know, it's from a black exploitation film and it's called Walk On Nigger, Walk On. And it's like he, and, and Creech, the singer, was just like, dude, I use that as our play on me. I'm like, yeah, it's one of the baddest punk rock songs ever. And it's Scatman Crothers just playing a, I think it's a baritone you, but it's so out of hand great that I don't know how everybody on the planet doesn't know the song. But it was from some black exploitation film. But it's just genius. But I mean, it's like I love, I, that's why we got along so well. Because it was like I always, with all those bands, even like Willie Dixon, it was like, that was punk rock to me, what they were singing about. Same thing I was singing about. You know, Hillbilly's been like put down. You know, they stole our, stole our fucking music, man. Trust me, if I'd have heard Hank Williams and Bill Monroe and all that when I was growing up, I'd have never left the farm. But I didn't. I heard Barbara Mandrell and God, just I can't worst crap on the planet. You know, they'd already stolen it. That's why music's important. Made a lot of kids hate where they were from. Especially if they were halfway smart. They didn't, like me, I didn't know why I didn't like it at that point. I mean, I learned later that they'd just stolen it and instilled the Nashville sound and, you know, songwriters and, that aren't from the South that have any relation to people from the South, you know, writing songs. Players not from the you know, so they 
totally ruined it. And that's why Hillbillies lost their way. Because they took our music. But with Hank 3, we tried to restore it. And I think we did a good job doing it. Oh, yeah. We definitely did a good job. Uh, now, making kids that were from the South. That they weren't just a bunch of dumb fuck buck tooth, even gap tooth, even though that's what I am. Uh, idiots, because we're not. And that was one for them that it was like, you got a band from your place that you can be proud of because we can kick any metal band's ass, any whatever band's ass. And it was like, it was good. Were you enjoying more the metal part of the show or the hillbilly part of the show? They were. They. I. I loved it all. It was like because it was his music. So, mm -hmm. it, we were friends way before I played with him. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I was there for the like the band. I was there for the recording of his first record. Like with the band, you know what I'm saying? I, it was, I was. Oh, so, so you saw both Jasons, both uh, Jasons play with Hank. Yeah, Jason Brown, Jason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And and I love both of them. Jason Brown's a dear friend of mine, man. It's like, I mean, he hates me, but no, he doesn't. But I mean, but uh, Burns and I didn't know each other that well. But I mean, I like Burns. But. Uh, When I don't, I don't take any credit for what Shelton did because I don't, but we did fit together very well, and it and that's kind of when it became whatever it became instead of I don't know, but I, it was because I loved him and I believed in him so much, and I wasn't just a side guy there. For a paycheck, playing in a cool band. I didn't give any fuck about any of that. Just wanted to crush people. And we did. But that was the difference. It's like, I was his biggest fan. I was just lucky the one that got to play with him. That's awesome. And uh, I, I would like to hear your perspective on something since you've been in the music business for such a long time. Uh, how has things changed for you as a musician from since you started until now? The rules when we first started, there weren't any rules. I mean, we'd have <laughs> four stacks plugged into it. One socket with the stuff melting, and <laughs> be like, it's fine. I don't know. It's like, like I said, they left us alone pretty good. I mean, on this last tour, but there were a couple of times when it's like, when it comes to smoking in the green rooms and this and that, and it's like, how the fuck do you expect us to be? fucking sequestered back here it's a mile and a half inside this cave of a place you know some room place that has three stages or something you know and it's like <laughs> you're gonna go oh yeah you can't do anything <laughs> it's like uh i want to start passing laws like you know how we can smoke on stage because we're gonna change the same thing backstage it's like it's, it's for those times that's private areas and that's legal but I mean, it was just like threatening to kick me out. And it just was like, Jesus. I thought this is rock and roll. But the things that have changed, uh, the sincerity and the drive of the people that are playing music. The only people that are on the road right now, we're all old. I mean, 
if they're in some new band, you may see them for a second, but they're gone because these kids don't want to do the shit. It's just work. What do you mean 30 shows in 30 days? Well, that's the way it works. Days off suck, and you waste money. You know, so it's like, that's why, I mean, besides Hank 3, really, since Nirvana, who's done anything? Really? It's just pathetic. And it's sad. And it's like, because art and music and literature, real art, real music. I mean, music that's born of pure motive and skills and, you know, hands of skilled musicians and, uh, and literature. I was just saying, hey, you know, like with the music, it's like art and music and literature and all these things are so important, especially that they're real. and It's not just some fabricated BS or whatever. And when you don't have that, it's really the definition of the dark ages. And even though we have all these devices and all these things that do things for us and blah, blah. I mean, it's leaving us spiritually hollow. And spiritually hollow people don't write great songs and put on great shows and write great books and put on great theater and things. And I hope that there's something that happens where it's like people just put down the... <clears throat> I like the internet for the fact that it's an amazing library. But outside of that, I'm, it's, I, I, I just don't find much in it. I'd rather play the guitar. <laughs> Do you guys tour anymore? I thought I well, saw not, you. Du not during COVID, but like we've been since... COVID started, I haven't played with Tiger Army at all. Do you guys uh, play it? Then until the until the COVID, uh, until the whole pandemic started, like we were playing all the time, a couple of times in Europe per year, like a few we times. We should together. What is it? Out there next, I'm coming out there in the spring. All right. I'm serious. It's like it would be good. I think it will be a good idea. I'll pass it, pass the idea along to the right people. Do you, I'd love to see that. I mean, but it's like we—I know we play the same place. Do you like play the Casbah and like do you play like Alex's in Long Beach and shit like that? And we usually play in 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 LA. We usually play Wiltern, a couple of days. It, Wiltern. I don't know that place. I usually, I've been playing the Redwood in LA. Uh, in LA, and I yeah, know. Yeah, I know Redwood. That's a cool place. Wiltern is yeah, a but little place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wiltern, I think it's three or four thousand seater, something like You're that. You're playing three thousand, four thousand seaters. Yeah, we usually sell out two or three nights in a row. Well, then I'm sorry I asked you to tour. I didn't know that. That's great. No, <laughs> but it's still it's, it's, it's still be playing. great, you know. If you play the shitty punk rock bars I play, you're like, no, we play the arena. Uh, no, no, I know no, you're I, own band and a big band. I didn't. That's good, brother. That's like huge numbers. Uh, uh, last time when we played Wilton, right before COVID started, Wayne Hancock opened for us. Oh, uh, Wayne did? Yeah, Wayne did. Yeah. I love Wayne. Wayne and I tour together all the time, and it's like, it's, <laughs> I love it. No, Wayne, yeah, Wayne, I love great. Wayne. He's yes. a he's a, a man. Some of Wayne's records, you could put those up against Louis Jordan records, Charlie Christian records. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like he's uh, it, he's one of the few musicians in the last fifty years that has done something like that. Is that is capable of making records like that? Oh, it's amazing! You know, thunderstorms or neon signs is still one of my favorites. Uh, no doubt about it. It's like yeah, that's a masterpiece. It is probably, probably my favorite record of his. A lot of songs are great, production is great, and the 
vibe is great musicianship is great no, like, I ain't playing steel guitar man. <laughs> it's uh i remember that when that that album came out i was so excited about it it was, it was cool Something no, different. I mean, wayne it's like i've known wayne for a long time he was just he's always so funny he's like Man, I remember when you used to like sing the proper country songs, all great and everything. Well, look at you now. What happened? <laughs> Just like he gets it. He always like he'd really like what I'm doing now. He always told me because we were we did a show at uh, at uh, Heavy Metal Shop in Salt Lake there, you know, in the record store, and he and I played acoustic, and it was the first time he'd heard me acoustic. He's like. He was like, God damn, you write great fucking songs. If you did that, you'd be playing arenas. <laughs> I was like, oh, thank you, Wayne. But yeah, it was the first time he'd ever heard my stuff. Because it was always so loud and so punk rock. It was like, oh. <laughs> he was like, he never heard the words or anything. No, he thought he gave us it. I thought that he was going to do one of me and Sean's. We have a, me and Sean have a song called Hillbilly Playboy. It's like, I swear he thought I, I was going to cover it because we were we were out with Wayne and uh, me and Sean were, uh, Sean was, yeah, I was like, I was doing my show, but I'd bring Sean up and he'd do like five or six songs with me. But it was that when we were out with Wayne. And uh, he thought our song was, he, he thought it was a cover of like some of Great Old Song. I go, no, that's one of ours. He said, no shit. I was like, yeah. <laughs> that that that's cool. Like like I love his music and you know he's probably not a big fan of punk rock and metal, right? No. <laughs> no, Wayne is a wonderful man, but he, he tolerated, but I mean no. <laughs> okay. I mean no. Yeah. I don't know him well. I met him a couple of times, but you know, I'm friends with most of his bass players <laughs> he's had a lot of bass players oh yeah had a lot of yeah I think, three and often. I think he's doing that uh, bart's playing with him and, and uh i don't know he's playing bass right now well me neither i i forgot who was the who was, was the last one though no, but man, if anybody that wants to do any of that, if you want to be an upright bass player, yeah, you need to go like do your time with Wayne Hancock because that's about the only place you can do it. I mean, at least you like learn it from somebody who knows what he's doing. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's why I went to Nashville, dude. It was like, I, I, I was like, gonna, and that's what I did. I played with, dude, everybody that I was playing with was old man i mean when i got the gig with jimmy martin i was just like ecstatic you know i mean jimmy was one of my heroes and it's like and jimmy loved me i was like i knew i was doing all right i was like you're playing in a band with jimmy martin and he's not screaming at you you're doing okay because you're screaming at everyone else not me except when i slapped the bass ah interesting no, King, of, King was, of Bluegrass didn't like slap bass, huh? Dude, during Freeborn Man, I got a little excited with the festival. <laughs> and, I, and I went, doo -doo 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 -doo, back up to the track. And man, he turned around and looked at me so hard that his hat stayed forward. And it <laughs> fell back on his head when he looked back at the audience. And I was like, I crawled by behind the bass and oh i had a couple of things with jimmy it was like my i'm proud to that first gringo record it was like it, it it was big on college radio and and uh it was some kids from msu M michigan state i think it was a festival in michigan bluegrass festival but they were the kids from the radio station at michigan state and uh and jimmy would always have me stand next to him at the merch table because i dressed up nice and whatever and he liked man <laughs> but he was standing there he's like he's like man see even these kids love me man jimmy martin <laughs> he talked about it. and they walk up and they go hey aren't you jim from gringo i went yeah he goes man we love that record it's like we play it all the time at the station <laughs> and they walked off and jimmy martin goes those kids don't know shit <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, it was weird. It was like because I was playing with Shelton, to, and it was like he got he, he got mad at me because he was like because I was doing shows with him, and I was like I love this Jimmy. It's like and uh, but he was like at one point he goes, "You want to be in Jimmy Martin's band?" And I said, "Jimmy, I'll do every show I can." I didn't ask you that. <laughs> you want to be in Jimmy Martin's band? And I said. And he kept pushing me. I go, I'll do every show, Jimmy. I just need to know when they are. I'll skip. <laughs> I didn't ask you that. And I had to tell him no. Oh, wow. I know. It's, it's, uh... All right, man. My phone's going to die. All right. Uh, uh, you're going to need to edit it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, thanks a lot. He's for being a part of the slap stream is there anything else that you wanted to mention that we haven't talked about i think we were, we've been talking for almost two hours so no but uh world needs more upright basses oh yeah more people playing them and uh, i agree with that because like i said it's like no other instrument and i mean uh, you know Right hands, I think, can do amazing things. But I'm proud to talk to you and great for your success and everything. But yeah, you ever want to slap an old man on one of your bills out there, you call me. <laughs> That'll be fun. And that world definitely needs more upright basses and more uh, bassists and more slap slappers. So that's why I'm doing the slap stream so that people can get uh hear all these stories firsthand from all these amazing players from all the genres they really had you know jazz guys and blues guys and rockabilly psychobilly like anything bluegrass so it could be used anywhere i know your phone's gonna die i would like to thank you again for being a part of the slap stream i no. really hope i'm gonna see you uh slap your bass or your performance you can watch I, I, you can watch the other hank three so there's tons of videos of oh that. yeah i see i see that i somebody sent me when i hadn't seen it in a while it was like us at the uh, grand Ole opry on the hank's anniversary i was like it was awesome it was me and him and uh donnie here and it was like uh, that's the he was the house we recorded uh straight to hell and it was like i was living there but it was donnie's house he didn't live there but it was donnie, donnie plays with bob dylan and he's a uh, like an amazing, like real hillbilly fiddle player. And yeah, it was just the three of us, no drums or nothing. Played uh, Thrown Out of the Bar and uh, Howling at the Moon and it just sounded great. And I liked that we did it like that with no drums or nothing. Old Grand Ole Opry style. Yeah, because it was at the Ryman. Nice, sweet. All right, man, it was a pleasure. Awesome. That was great pleasure talking to you and good luck with everything and can't wait to see you somewhere down the road. Thank you. Welcome. Good night. Thank you. Good night. All right. That was a special one. That was a 59th episode of the Slap Stream with Georgia live from Slapsville. Here I am to promote upright slab bass as much as possible. So if you're new to the genre, if you're new to the bass or to the upright slab bass, it's, fun. it's time for you to slap it. And as I mentioned, you can hear all these firsthand stories from all these amazing bass players on my channel. So you should definitely slap that subscribe button, slap that like button, uh, help me with that YouTube algorithm share the video if you like uh, and if you'd really like to support the channel and my work uh, check out the patreon link in the description of this video after you subscribe to the channel and check out venmo and paypal as well and if you'd like to get a art of slab base t-shirt or don't forget never fret t-shirt that link is in the description of this video as well uh, and until next time, don't forget, never fret, slide it in smooth, and keep it in the groove.
This is Jorge, and I will see you next Saturday.